And thanks for bearing with us. Enjoy. Thank you. <clears throat> well, I was born with a very rare visual condition called achromatism, which is a visual condition that doesn't allow me to see colors. So I only see in gray scale, and I've never seen color. So I don't really know what blue means or what yellow means, because I've never seen it. So when I was growing up, this uh, mystery of color started to grow and grow and grow. And I always had this wish to be able to perceive color, but there was no way I could. Many people ask me, but why would you like to perceive color? If, if you see in black and white, you can continue normal life seeing in black and white. And to me, it's fine to see in black and white, but I wanted to perceive color somehow because color is a very, very social element. It's not only a visual thing that attracts people, it's also a very social thing. Like, uh, if you don't see color, you, you still hear words like Bluetooth, yellow pages, green peas, the red cross, orange. In society, color is used constantly. So uh, I always felt that I was missing out something. So, for example, it's even in surnames. Uh, Gordon Brown has it in his surname. So you can, uh, Pink Floyd is also another group. It has nothing to do with color, but I, I, it, it makes me feel that I'm missing out some information. Also, when color is used as a code, I find it's uh, really hard to know, for example, which one's the hot water, which one's the cold water. Uh, and also, when it's used as a map to coding maps, uh, this one is easy, it's Sao Paulo, but if I go to Tokyo, it's really difficult to understand this map in grayscale. And um, there's also people use color to describe people or to describe things. If someone says, a girl with ginger hair, blue eyes, and dressed in pink, I don't get much information. I just know that the girl has hair, that she has eyes, and that she's not naked. So I'm missing out a lot of information with this. This is another example. Italy, France, and Ireland share the same flag. Uh, so in history or in uh, normal culture uh, things, I, I don't get to know which flag is which. That's why I decided when I was 16 to study fine art and to study color. And there is where I learned more about color theory. And I, I found it uh, really interesting. But I also felt a bit like a monk because I, I was uh, studying something that I couldn't see. So it made me feel a bit strange in class, but I, it made me understand better uh, what color was. One of the interesting things I learned is the relationship that many people have done between color and sound. Newton, centuries ago, related color with a musical scale. And because I was learning uh, music, it made me feel closer to color. So I felt this relationship between color and sound very interesting. So I later decided to study music composition. And there is where, uh, in 2003, actually, it's the year before 2004, is when I met Adam Montandon in a conference about cybernetics. Uh, he talked about how we could use technology to extend our senses. And I found this extremely interesting. So I went to him and I asked him if he thought we could create something so that I could extend my senses and perceive color. So we started a project and the result, the first prototype was this, was a webcam connected to a computer that I wore in a backpack uh, and a headset of um, headphones and the software in the backpack transformed the colors in front of me into musical notes. So if I had red in front of me, I heard a note. If I had blue in front of me, I heard a different note. So I started to use this uh, as a way of learning colors around me. And the first colors I memorized were very basic colors. It was a very basic scale. And I started using it as a tool, but suddenly I felt uh, it was, uh, it was so, so interesting to perceive colors that I started to using it daily, 24 hours a day, and I decided to not take it off. So I started to hear colors every day uh, for 24 hours, and uh, I got used to hearing color constantly. So when my brain got used to hearing these uh, main colors, we added more colors in between and more colors in between, 
until we got to a full scale of 360 <coughs> uh, microtones, which is 360 different tones, one for each degree of the color wheel. So I hear, um, I will play how colors sound to me. Maybe, can you hear? Yeah. So now you can hear variations that go from red to orange. Now you can hear different shades of yellow. Now you, you hear shades of green. And it keeps going up and up and up until we get to higher pitches, which are higher frequencies. Now, the relationship between the colors and the sounds is not arbitrary. The, the relationship between colors and sound is the physical relationship between color and sound. If we could hear the frequency of red, we would actually hear a note between F and F sharp. And if we could hear the different colors in front of us, we would hear these uh, different microtones. And it goes on up until the end of the circle, which is an octave. So after that, I, I, I noticed that I was missing another perception, which is saturation. I was perceiving different tones for different uh, color tones, but I wasn't perceiving saturation, which is uh, one of the three properties of color. So Peter Keshe from Slovenia, he added different volume levels depending on if the color is very saturated or if the color is dull. So. If I have a very uh, vibrant um, red, I will hear it in a high volume, if, and if it's dull, it will be in a lower volume. So something strange happened. After five months of hearing color constantly, I noticed that the software and my brain had united when I woke up one morning, and I noticed that I had been dreaming colors. I, had not I noticed that in my dreams, I had been hearing different notes for different colors. And that's when I started to feel that the software and my brain had united and had created this new sense that allowed me to dream in color. And that's when I started to feel and understand the word cyborg, when cybernetics and organisms unite and they create this new sense. I started to feel that the cybernetic extension was no longer a device, but a part of my body, an extension of my senses and a new part of my body. It's not the union between the head and my electronic eye what makes me feel like a cyborg. It's the union between the software and my brain. Because I had been using the eye for many months, but it was when I noticed this union between software and brain when I felt cyborg. Something happened later that year that I had to renew my passport and I wasn't allowed to renew my passport because there's a law in the UK that says that you're not allowed to appear on your passport photo with any electronic equipment. So I, I sent them a letter telling them that I felt that what they were seeing on the picture was not an electronic equipment but a part of my body, an extension of my senses. And then they replied saying that they didn't uh, quite uh, accept this, that they needed some proof of a doctor. So I sent, uh, when well, I went to see my doctor, he sent a letter explaining that I felt that this was a part of my body. And then after some time, they finally accepted me to appear with the electronic eye. And now I'm allowed to go to airports and other places without having to justify what I'm wearing. If your official image has an electronic eye, you are allowed to go through anywhere. Now the iBorg evolved and evolved and it's still evolving. First I was using a computer on my backpack, I was using headphones, but headphones was blocking my sense of hearing. So what I tried to do is to stop using headphones and to start using my bone to hear color. 
we are not using our bone to hear, but we could all use our bone to perceive sound if we wanted. Actually, the bone can, ex can perceive more sounds than our ears, so we could all extend our hearing if we use our bone to hear. So I started to pressure the sound to my bone so that I could hear colors through bone conduction and normal sounds through air conduction. So this is something that helped me a lot to separate visual sounds from audio sounds. Then another big change was to stop using a computer and to start using a chip. From 2010, I started to use a chip, so now there's no computer, no headphones, it's just a chip pressuring my bone, and I hear colors through bone conduction. The next step between September and October this year is to have the all osteo-integrated inside the bone in a hospital in Barcelona, when I'll be able not to hear colors through pressuring the bone, but it will be inside the bone and it will ver verberate the whole cranium. So it will be a much stronger feeling and a much stronger perception and it will also allow me to extend my hearing. So it's still evolving. Another change I did is that I noticed that this color wheel uh, based on human perception was very limited because humans don't perceive color very well. Uh, human color vision is very, very limited. So I decided just to continue extending my color sense and include infrared and include ultraviolet to the color to scale, to the color to sound scale. So now I can actually hear infrared, I can perceive infrared, I can perceive ultraviolet, I can perceive colors that the human eyes cannot perceive. And this allows me, for example, to detect if there's any uh, movement detectors in a room. It allows me to perceive color when there's complete darkness and it allows me to know if it's a good day or a bad day to sunbathe because uh, ultraviolet is a dangerous color, a color that can actually kill us. So I think we should all have this wish also to extend our senses and perceive colors that actually other animal species already perceive. Well, one of the biggest changes in my daily life has been the way I dress. Before I used to dress in a way that it looked good, now I dress in a way that it sounds good. So, for example, to <laughs> today I'm wearing C major, so I'm, I'm dressed in three different notes that sound really good. This would be another way of dressing in C major. This would be dressed in F major. And this would be a minor chord. I would go like this in a funeral, for example. And here I'm wearing Stravinsky. Another big thing has changed is the way I perceive food. Now I can display food on a plate and compose a song or, or eat my favorite song, depending on how I display a salad. So imagine if if all salads sounded like Leggy Gaga, for example, many, many teenagers would probably eat more vegetables. <laughs> this is how some supermarket products sound. Milk is silent. So white things and black things don't sound, and pure gray things don't sound. And it's almost impossible to find things that don't sound, because white is never white and gray is never gray. There's always some kind of tiny bit of color in what we think is colorless. So now galleries have become concert halls and supermarkets have begun like nightclubs because it's really, really colorful a supermarket. It's like electronic music, especially the aisles with cleaning products. It's just so exciting because you find different uh, colors uh, that don't really, ex you don't never expect to find together. And I can say, for example, that Picasso sounds good. And this is something that has changed the way I perceive artists, visual arts, uh, painters have become composers, so it's a very different experience. Uh, this is some, some paintings sound like this.
There's a lot of microtones, microcolors. These are all the colors together. Andy Warhol sounds very saturated, so you can hear it from a long distance. If there's a Warhol hanging down there, I can hear it really loud from a long uh, distance. So another paintings more classical, they sound uh, a bit less saturated, like these paintings, uh, or also the Mona Lisa, they sound less, uh, less saturated. So. So I started to feel, after some months, a secondary effect, a chord that we were not expecting. Is uh, I, I turned uh, the telephone line, I heard that it was green, and I felt that the telephone was green, but it wasn't green. It was actually the, 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 actual, the, the sound of the phone sounded just like green. So it started to happen with more and more things, especially electronic things that sounded just like color. Uh, and then I started to feel that music was also colorful. Each note in music was a different color, so I was able to start painting color and paint people's voices, because when we speak we use different frequencies and I related each frequency to a different color. So I started to create paintings from music. This is, for example, For Elisa by Beethoven, very pink and very purple, very feminine. Um, this is Mozart. Mozart it was very, very yellow. Most of Mozart's music is, is yellow. Uh, these are the four seasons of Vivaldi. And this is, uh, for example, I, I exhibit these paintings without telling which music it is. For example, the one on the left is Mozart and the one on the right is Justin Bieber. So when I, don't, I ask people, which one do you prefer? I never tell which one's which. And uh, it's interesting to see how many people like uh, uh, Justin Bieber, actually. And uh, these are two speeches as well. You can transform uh, speech when someone talks, uses different frequencies which relate to different colors. One of them is Martin Luther King, the other one is Hitler. And I also never put which one's which. And uh, I ask people, which one do you prefer? When I tell them that the one they prefer maybe is Hitler, then they suddenly change their, their the preference. The one on the left is Hitler, and the one on the right is Martin Luther King. Hitler used a lot of different frequencies, so it results in a very diff very colorful uh, painting, whereas Martin Luther King used uh, very same tones, which were very high pitch, which relate to blues and purples. So another project I did is, is to detect the colors of cities. I, I thought that cities would be gray, but since I heard color, I saw that it was completely false. Cities are not gray. Cities have uh, dominant colors, and each city has a different dominant color. So I started a project around Europe trying to detect the dominant colors of cities. And uh, some of the results are this. Madrid is amber terracotta. You can detect these two colors in every single street. Whereas in Lisbon, you don't detect amber nor terracotta. You detect a uh, type of turquoise and a type of yellow in each street. And then London is very, very red and very, very yellow. So I'll be performing at 8 o'clock the different capital cities with each color and the dominant speed of people walking in these um, cities. So to me now, a girl with ginger hair, blue eyes and dressed in pink now means something which didn't meant anything to me before. Now I can say that it's a girl with F sharp hair, C sharp eyes and dressed in F. So I can definitely detect this person and I will know what you're talking about. Now, another thing that has changed is the way I perceive people's faces, because when I look at someone, I can hear different notes in a face. So instead of drawing someone's eyes, someone's nose, someone's lips, what I do is I write down the different notes that I detect on a face, and then I, I, I send an, uh, an MP3 of their face so that they can hear how they sound. And this is, for example, someone's face sounds like this. This is a green frequency. He has green eyes. Here, I've added the sound of the hair, which is brown. The lips is the lowest sound. The other eye, because we don't have the same color eyes. They, they are slightly different, usually. And the skin. 
and now we'll be able to hear all these notes together and they create the unique chord for each face. Okay, so this face sounds like this and it's really hard to find someone that would sound exactly the same. So I've been listening to famous uh, faces and I've been creating sound portraits of people that everyone know how they look like but you never know how they will sound. Um, this Prince Charles was one of the first sound portraits I did. Here I was still wearing the, c the cables and the computer and I think he thought I was going to blow myself up because I, I, I looked a bit dangerous here. So, but then I, I listened to his face and we'll be able to hear how, how he sounds. Um, everyone sounds absolutely different and uh, it's something I really enjoy doing. Here we can hear Well, you can't really hear it, can you? Well, they sound, they all sound different, okay? What I detected is that um, no matter how many, how many people I, I, I listened to, there was something in common, which is that, well, that there are no white skins and that there are no black skins. We all share the same tone of skin, which is orange. Um, People that say that they are black, they are not actually black. I, I can hear that they are not black. They are very, very dark orange, which is very dark brown, which is also orange. People that say they are white, they are not white. They sound light orange. So we all share the same color, which is orange. What we, we, we differentiate is with the light, but we all sound the same. So with my eyes shut, I cannot distinguish someone from African and someone from India or someone from Japan. They all have the same uh, tone. So something I do now is face concerts. Instead of playing an instrument, I ask the audience to cue and then I start playing the colors of people's faces by controlling the colors that I want people, the audience to hear. And um, the good thing about this is that if the concert doesn't sound good, it's the audience's fault, it's not my fault. So after some time, I started to receive a lot and a lot of emails of people interested in also hearing color or extending their senses. So in 2010, I decided to create the Cyborg Foundation, which is a foundation that helps people extend their senses by applying technology to the body. Now we have like three main aims. One is to help humans become cyborgs, so help humans extend their senses, whatever sense it may be, uh, by applying technology to the body. The second is to defend cyborg rights. We all have the right to appear on our passport with our own self um, uh, cybernetic extension if we want. And third is to promote the use of cybernetics as part of the body. We do not want to repair people, we want to extend people's senses. Now a cyborg is someone Cyborgs are those who incorporate cybernetics as part of their organism in order to modify, reduce, extend their own senses, perception, or ability. I say reduce because someone might want to incorporate cybernetics in their body in order to reduce their senses, which would be very unusual, but it might happen that someone doesn't want to hear a specific sound and wants to annulate this sound by lowering the frequencies he or she hears. Some projects we've done is with blind people that wanted to extend their senses. It has a different effect. We were using eyeborgs with blind people that used to see color, so this actually activated memory and they were able to revisualize color and visualize color again if they, if they knew the, the color to sound scale. Also, it can be used to translate other things. You can ask, uh, it, you can change the chip and detect other things that we cannot detect or we can also use it to transform words into w spoken words. So there's no need to translate books into braille anymore if you use an electronic eye that can read any word in front of you. There's many possibilities that we can uh, use with uh, electronics, uh, electronic eyes. There's also the possibility of doing it the other way around. Instead of hearing color, you can visualize uh, color. So you could, if you are completely deaf, you could actually use um, a, color to, a sound to color sensor that can allow you to detect the frequency in which someone is speaking or you can visualize music. 
or it can be used to hear or visualize sounds that we cannot hear because they are too high or too low. Um, we did another project, which was the fingerboard, which is not a cyborg project because it's a. Uh, it was a. Uh, came a boy with just one finger, he wanted to extend his senses, so we added a, a small camera in his finger, so he was able to record and take pictures with his own hand. He didn't have to use a, an iPhone, he could use his own hand. But it's still not a cyber project because there's no communication between the camera and his body. When we get to have, um, the main difference is that you need to, there needs to be communication between the uh, electronic part and the human, otherwise it's not cybernetic, it's just, uh, you're just using uh, your hand as a tripod. You need to be communicating with the uh, electronic extension in order to feel uh, this cyber cyborg union. There's another project called the Speedborg, which allows uh, choreographer Moon Rivas to detect movement without having to use her eyes. It's a pair of earrings that vibrate when there's movement in front of her. So if she turns around the earrings the other way around, she can detect if someone's walking behind her. It can also allow her to detect exact speeds because she becomes a radar because she has two different senses. So she, if she memorizes the interval between one ear and one ear, she can develop the sense of exact speed and tell us at which speed someone is walking. She's also in, in her passport, she also has the, the electronic earrings in her passport, so when she, when she travels uh, at the airport, they, they cannot force her to take off the electronic earrings. Now I think cyborgism can be two things, an art movement in which artists create works through a new sense or sensory extension created from the union between organism and cybernetics. And I think it, it is also a social, a social movement in which humans extend their senses by applying cybernetics to the body. I think we are now in this moment in which we'll stop using technology as an external tool and we'll start using it more as a part of our body. I think we are the generation that needs to do and to, to do this change, to stop creating applications for mobile phones and to start creating applications for our own body. We don't need external tools. We've been doing this for many, many centuries. We've been using external tools uh, um, and now is the moment to start using them as part of the body. We've been contaminated by the 20th century, which has seen this union as dangerous, as negative, and as uh, unhealthy, and as not human. But as, as, as far as it's going now, this union is being very positive and very human. I think that the fact of extending our senses is very animal-alike, because all the senses that we are thinking about creating our senses that already exist in nature. Many animals can perceive ultraviolets, dogs can hear in, uh, sounds that we cannot perceive, uh, sharks can detect electromagnetic fields so they know where the north is. There's so many senses that we could learn from other animals and that we could apply to our body by using cybernetics that I think that we are the ones that should be doing this right now. We must all think that knowledge comes from our senses. So if we extend our senses, we will consequently extend our, sen our knowledge. And I think this is what I really, really noticed that to me it has changed. From the moment I started to using technology as part of my body, I started to feel and to understand color. Up until before, I was using external tools to know the color of things and it wasn't making any difference. So I would encourage you all to start thinking about creating technology in order to apply it to our body and to start thinking about extending your senses by applying technology to your body. Thank you very much. Wow. Thank you so much, Neil Arvison. Thank you. Thank you for, thank you for coming out. Thank you for your inspiring speech. So I'm pretty sure you all have uh, some interesting questions to ask. So why don't we just uh, get straight to it? You're the first one. Neil, hi. Um, I'm just curious, uh, have you done any neurophysiological measurements uh, while you're starting to use the device? I mean, 
like EEG or fMRI just to, to be curious uh, how your primary visual cortex uh, changed then or auditory cortex changed? Yes, I had an MRI done in May and I found that there was a really a new way of perceiving. They, I, they gave me glasses that I was seeing things and they were checking what the brain was doing. So when I had visual elements, my sound uh, cortex activated because I was so used to hearing, I'm so used to hearing C sharp when I look at the sky and I'm so used to hearing uh, F when I see a um, fire extinguisher that when, when they showed me the sky or when they showed me an, uh, an, a fire extinguisher, my uh, sound uh, cortex activated because my sound was expecting uh, uh, my brain was expecting to hear the sound of the of the of the images. Hmm. Uh, are you still able to remove the uh, the, the device? Uh, I would be able to remove, but I I don't want to remove it, and I haven't removed it since 2004. In September, October, it will be impossible to remove it because it will be inside the bone. And then once it's osteointegrated, which will take like two months to osteointegrate, then it's not possible to remove the audio input. But the chip is always outside because I, I constantly change the chip. So there's no, uh, it's no good use to have it inside unless it's a it's, uh, definite uh, chip. So you uh, also sleep with it? Sorry? So you also sleep with it? Yeah, yeah, I sleep with the eyewear and I shower with the eyewear. What I cannot do is I cannot go underneath the water with the, the electronic eye yet. How do you wash your hair then? Like this? I just ah. wash the hair. Yeah, the good thing is that I can perceive it's flexible. That's why I, I like, we should all have antennas because it's very practical. We could, yeah. Uh, brilliant presentation. Uh, I was just wondering if there are any particular situations where this technology fails you, like? Yeah, when I was using the computer, it froze sometimes, so I was hearing the same color all the time and I noticed that it was a problem of the phrasing. But no, not not for now. When when you when you are drunk or uh, ah, I don't know. Well, no. When <laughs> <laughs> the problem is when other people are drunk, because then they start touching my eye and they start uh, laughing at the, and it can be quite annoying. When I'm drunk, yes, maybe I hear more colors than normal. Fair enough. <laughs> uh, what is actually the eye? I mean, how precise it is. Um, what is the range? Or is it just a cheap webcam, or you made like special device, or it, what it kind it of? It only thing detects is? hue and saturation. It, it discards color, I, uh, light, so it doesn't have a problem with if there's a change of light. But it only detects the dominant color in front of me. I could have a detector of my eye, and, and then it would be ch it would change the color that I'm looking at. But for now, to me, it's perfectly fine to hear just the dominant color in front of me. Hmm. Um, what is the uh, uh, most dominating color in Berlin? The in where? In Berlin. In Berlin. Uh, I have it written down. It was a type of between green and a type of green uh, something and a type of yellow orange, I think. But I will be playing it tonight at 8 and it will be written Berlin and it will also the girl with the speed detectors, uh, she will project the speed in which the, 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 the average speed in which people in Berlin walk and in which other cities the, in Europe, the average speed in which people walk in each city. Thank you. Sorry, you said you changed the chip. You must have to keep the software similar so you get the same sounds. What, why would you change the chip? I haven't changed the chip yet, but I, I expect that I will want to upgrade the, the chip. I might want to change uh, something in the chip. So I, I don't find it useful to have it inside, cause, uh, but what I need to have inside is the, all the sound input, because then it will vi vibrate inside the the bone, which is what I really want 
to have. Now it's pressuring, and the, in September, October, it will be in. So the only thing that I'm implanting is, is the audio output of the chip. So, so you have some enhancements in mind? Uh, yes, because uh, when you have a sound input in the bone, you can also extend your hearing. So I'll be able to perceive more sounds than through air conduction. So I will definitely uh, also extend my, my hearing next. But it's a consequence of hearing color. Mm. Hi, um, does your sound color perception also has its limits? Do you feel color headaches or pain? Yeah, I had strong, strong headaches at the beginning. Uh, the first five weeks, I had headaches because it was constant input and a new, new information constantly. But after five weeks, my brain got used to hearing color all the time. So I'm constantly hearing uh, color, and my brain is, finds it completely normal now. Um, so, so could, could we kill you if we put you in a colorful place for a couple of years? Would it kill sorry? you? Like, could you die somehow? Or? I, w I would probably, yeah, maybe get tired. I don't, know, maybe, I don't know. But I really enjoy colorful places like supermarkets. I, I usually just go for a walk in a supermarket just to hear the, the colors. But at night, I, I, my zone where I sleep is in black and white, so it doesn't sound. So would you mind? Uh, would you say that you're more attracted now b by persons, for example, more about the tone you like most, or more about like like their physiognomics and stuff? Yeah, sometimes you have uh, surprises that someone extremely ugly sounds very good, and someone very attractive sounds very very bad. So it's difficult at this time when what to decide. It's difficult. The best thing would be someone that sounds good and looks good. That would be the perfect uh, person to look at. Um, well, you keep change, it changes color, but it's some in general you now sound between uh, F sharp and G, so it's between orange and yellow in general as the dominant hue. Hello, and uh, I was asking to me, how can you understand? Uh, when uh, some people speak to you, I, I mean, you are looking to me and here there are uh, lots of colors. You are hearing my voice and the sounds of those colors. How can you understand what I'm saying to you? Because I'm hearing color through bone conduction and it's a bit different and I'm hearing you through air conduction. So it's a, a different channel. It's a new sense. It's not, I'm not using my hearing sense anymore. I'm using a, a new sense, which is to hear through the bone. That's why I can make it uh, clear. But And also because this is electronic sounds and you, you're not um, giving me a sine wave, so it's not confusing. But if there's electronic music uh, coming through my ears and coming through my bone, then I can get confused sometimes. So electronic concerts, music can be very um, stimulating. Hi. Do you know anyone with an electronic nose? Sorry? With an electronic nose. Do you know anyone? No. So how would that, would you have an idea about how an electronic nose would function? Would you, would you could use that? Well, we, we've that worked with two girls that don't have the sense of, col of, of smell. And we, we tried to transform smell, dangerous smells into a type of vibration that it would vibrate if there's the smell of gas or the, or the, ch the, the child has, uh, has to be changed. It would detect by vibration. But it's been really, really hard uh, to, to do. It's, it's not finished at all. Could be nice to detect the pheromones, for instance. If you can uh, detect the pheromones, you can ah. not only listen, but see and also know their chemistry. Mm -hmm. Um, you said earlier that your auditive cortex is working through vision, even without the device in the um, yes. MRI experiment. Yes. So yes. don't you feel the need, like, someday you could, like, actually live without the device, but uh, having learned a new language? Yeah, if I, if I block my eye, now, the, now I'm not receiving sound because it's black, but when I move 
when I move my head, my brain creates uh, electronic sounds because my brain is so used to hear electronic sounds when I move because it changes that my brain creates, this is what happens as well when I dream, that uh, my brain creates sounds, but then they don't correspond to reality, I think. They're just uh, arbitrary, so. Hi, do you think that device will reach a point that will teach the brain how to react and it will be so advanced that it would just be like necessary to use for a certain time and then to be removed, do you think we will get there? Do you know what I mean? That the device will be so advanced, so advanced in the future that will only be necessary for the user to keep it for a while until the brain is taught by the device. You know what I mean? Um. That the brain doesn't need the hardware anymore, that it's just adapted to... Uh I don't think so. Well, th I've, I've been approached by people that do hypnotism and they said that they could in, uh, by hypnotism, they could put a software in my brain, but I never replied because I was a bit scared about this. And uh, but maybe I don't know if you can uh, introduce a software in your brain without uh, the actual mm, uh, extension. Just like resonance, in the, you know that it teaches the ear with the device, and the ear it, it starts to react. And I was thinking that this device that you're using now. In the future, we will allow the people to, uh, the, the device will teach the brain how to react so they can be, you know, used to, like you said, that you're used to, even though you block it, you can feel. Mm -hmm. And then in the future, we'll be so good and so advanced that you, you will have to remove that for a while because the brain will learn how to react. That would work with someone that sees color, but with someone that doesn't see color like me, I don't know how it would work, but it would work with someone that sees color and wears the eyeball for months. I'm sure that when you remove the eyeball, then you, you look at red and you hear red. That is probably uh, logical that it would happen, but not in my case. I don't think, you know, unless I look at something that I know that it's uh, blue like the sky or something specific. Hi, um, you mentioned earlier that it took you like five weeks to get used to the device. And if you are talking about extending the senses, do you think you'll need to introduce some kind of training or something for people who want to, to use the extended uh, as extension? Yeah, there is a need to, to there, there should be a, a clinic that specializes in, in uh, incorporating or implanting cybernetic extensions and a school that uh, teaches how to adapt to a new sense. This doesn't exist, so this is something that should happen in the next uh, decade, that there should be hospitals that uh, specialize on uh, extending senses and schools that teach you how to adapt to this new sense. Because in my case, it took me one year to convince the hospital, I, I want this to have operated, to convince the bioethical team that this was ethical. So if, if there was an independent clinic specializing on this, there wouldn't need to be a, a, a waiting list, like a, 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 such a bu bureaucratic uh, procedure. Hmm. Have a question here? Uh, hello. I had a magnet implanted in my finger uh, for 200 pounds, and it's British. It extended my sense of touch so I could feel electric fields from a distance. I think, you know, as far as I'm aware, this is the sort of cheapest, most broadly applicable or cybernetic available. Well, well, you know, would you agree, what's the most common way you think people will be extending their senses? The most common? Yeah. Yes, the most um, broad. I think it will be the use of the bone to hear. I think this is not being used enough, but mobile phones and internet connection through bone conduction is one of a very interesting next step. Not to use, not to use glasses, not to use uh, fingers, just to use our own bone to, to receive and to send messages uh, and to receive phone calls. Because you can hear people, you can be connected to somewhere else if you use your bone. Bone conducted internet and bone conducted phone calls. Um, is there a specific reason that you have it over your head and not at the side? Yes, I've had it different ways. I had it first, it was here and I had to move a lot. Then I had it here and I, I was only 
I felt I, there was one missing here. The antenna allows me to hear colors behind me, beside me, and it's very, very comfortable because I don't feel the, the weight. And um, from all the, the possible things I've, I've worn, this is the most practical. It's not even practical. There would be the possibility of implanting it here, but then I would be limited to what I have in front of me. This allows me to have 360 uh, degree color perception. And um, do you by any chance know how they are going to manage the transdermal part of the implant? Because for what I know, it's very hard to bring something through the skin and not infect it. There might be infection, but this, this can happen with, with any type of operation. Yeah, there's the risk of infection. Thank you. But it will be... Um, yeah. <laughs> it's a risk. Infection. Yeah, or re rejection. Uh, yeah. Hello, I wanted to ask how about your dreams? Are they colorful? Yes, I dream in, in, in grayscale, but in color. So I hear different colors in my dream. So it's not about looking, even when something accurate in your mind, you can see the color? No, I never see color. I perceive color through yeah. sound. To me, color is not a... I don't receive color through a visual uh, stimuli. It's a, through a sound stimuli. So when you're sleeping, you also see the... You also hear the colors. Yes. Oh, that's nice. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm not sure how many more questions you can handle, but we have five more minutes to go. I must say you're selling this really well, by the way. I'm actually considering becoming a cyborg myself. Okay, good. Really. <laughs> um, so, how do you feel about uh, having a few more questions? Fine. If there's if there's any more questions, I'll I'll be. Yeah, I think we can go on and on. Huh? Like you won't have dinner this way, so. <laughs> uh, well, so. just five minutes. Okay. Or two. All right. All right. Is there uh, any shop where you could buy an antenna or could you give a nearly price of it? We don't sell uh, any cybernetic extensions because we consider them part of the body. So we either donate them or explain to people how to create their own cybernetic extensions. Uh, we don't sell any type of iBorg or anything. There's an explanation online how to create your own. And when I visit blind communities or people around the world that want, we either give them a, a sample or we explain to them how to create one. Yeah. And it's really simple. It's usually very simple technology, but it's applied in a, in a very unusual way. Because, for example, the, the, detect, the, speed, the thing that allows you to detect movement is just the infrared. So it's, it's uh, like the hand dryers. It's just using infrared, but it, it, it gives a vibration. So it's very simple uh, material. Cheap. Uh, it's actually cheaper to become a cyborg than to buy an iPhone because you need, uh, yeah. <laughs> the problem with, with technology now is that you need an external tool. And uh, if you can avoid using the external tool, you can connect to, to technology without this tool. So this is why I think mobile phones and internet will start uh, ignoring this external tool and then we'll have it inside. It's, you avoid this uh, making this um, uh, object. I was wondering, could it possibly be used to correct um, color blindness? As in, if it could detect the wrong color and substitute it for the right color, possibly? Um, as in, to correct color blindness? As in, if you see the wrong color, and then you could possibly um, hear the right color, and could it um, cancel out the wrong color, possibly? Um, this is with people that confuse color, no? Like um, uh, in a different degree of color blindness, yeah, maybe you could use the iBorg only detecting those colors that you cannot detect well, which is usually red and green. So you could have it just that only detects red and green, and then you would be able to know which one's which. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So, um, what do, uh, do we have? All right. In which way uh, did your brain change? Is there uh, a part which is now less used or more used than by other people or in which way? No, the thing is that my visual and my audio parts are almost always activated because if there's sound, there mean, it means that there's color. And if there's color, there's sound. So 
it's it's a kind of both are usually always connected. And then if there's a visual stimuli, the sound uh, part will activate always. Okay. And there's no region which is now less used than before you. I don't think so. No. All right, Neil, I'm going to let you off the hook because <laughs> okay. this seems uh, we can go on and on like this because everybody's so eager and interested, as am I. Thank you very much for coming. Thank, Thank you, you all for coming. Thank you. Be sure to be here at 8 o'clock when he's performing with Moon. So, thank you. <laughs>